Hi, so welcome back to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. This lecture will be the third one in a series on the French-Algerian Albert Camus and his work The Myth of Sisyphus. Uh, but before we get into all that, I'd like to continue a tradition I started in the last video, which has to do with trying to keep my hair under control. Why do I need to keep my hair under control? Because it's getting so long and I can't, <laughs> no barbers are open in the middle of the coronavirus and so I can't get a haircut. Consequently, I'm going to start wearing probably very unprofessorial hats during these lectures just to keep my hair from flopping in my face. So here's your hat of the day. I'm gonna to try to wear it back so you can still sort of see my face a little bit in these videos. <laughs> I'll try to, there, there we go. All right, so hat of the day in the midst of the coronavirus. And I actually wanted to start out with this lecture by talking a little bit about the coronavirus and why it is freaking us out so much. And the reason why I want to talk about it is going to have to do with uh, some points we're going to make today about Albert Camus and his treatment of hopelessness and meaninglessness. So the question is, uh, why does the coronavirus freak us out so much these days? And the obvious answer is, well, because you can die from it, or at least suffer quite a bit from it. Uh, but I've noticed a kind of pattern in the news stories about who gets it and who dies from it and who gets it and who has relatively minor symptoms and all of that. And it kind of goes like this. For instance, uh, yesterday I was reading a story about a 95-year-old uh, World War II veteran who got the coronavirus and who, I guess, uh, did all the logical, sensible things and got through it. On the other hand, I've read stories about 23-year-olds or 25-year-olds or 28-year-olds who are fit, healthy, no prior medical conditions, and yet they ended up dying from it. And I think that's the clue to why it is that we're so freaked out by the coronavirus, especially when you consider the fact that every year in the United States, due to the regular every year seasonal flu, an average of 38,000 people die in the United States every single year over the last 10 year period. I actually looked those statistics up and did the calculation. So 38,000 people die every year from the regular every year seasonal flu on the average. Uh, thus far, due to the coronavirus, we've had a few thousand deaths, and that's certainly tragic, but it's not even yet getting close to the number of deaths attributable to the everyday, every year seasonal flu that we experience. So the obvious question is, well, what's so special about the coronavirus that we're all sheltered and huddled in our homes and fearing it and wearing masks in public when we have to go out and stuff like that. And I think it has to do with some of those news stories and more specifically with the element of seeming randomness in whom the coronavirus actually ends up killing. It doesn't seem terribly uh, that it's killing off you know, 90% of the time or 95% of the time, uh, the elderly or 95% of the time people with compromised physical systems. Seems like there's a fair amount of randomness in the equation. So I think that that's the key to understanding why we're so freaked out about it in a way that we're not freaked out about the every year seasonal flu. Like it's hard to say whom it will cut down, uh, whom it will let off relatively easily with uh, you know regular flu-like symptoms or even cold-like symptoms or seemingly according to the news some people uh, get it don't even know they get it and yet end up propagating it it's that element of randomness that is not really there in the everyday seasonal flu despite the fact that thus far at least the every year seasonal flu is much more lethal so uh, that element of randomness and the kind of terror it inspires in us is going to be a theme very much germane to uh, the element of hopelessness and meaninglessness that Albert Camus takes up within his analysis of the absurd. Okay, so what we've been doing in these last three videos is noticing uh, various ways in which life is fundamentally unreasonable, ridiculous, and absurd. Of course, in the first video in this series, uh, the main reason, according to Camus, is that we have in our heart a very rational longing to know what life is about, what its purpose is, what its meaning is, what the rules of the game are, where we come from, where we're going to go when we die, and so on. But the fact of the matter is that life answers 
none of that for us, so we end up constructing belief systems because we can't tolerate the anxiety of not knowing what it is that we really want to know, what our hearts long to know, ultimately. And those belief systems, according to Camus, constitute a form of suicide, a way of sort of killing off the more honest and direct part of our minds that would let these questions hang open and unanswered, uh, despite the fact that they tend to make us anxious. The next dimension of the absurd that we looked at at the very last video in this series has to do with uh, being honest and direct and lucid is the word that he likes in translation about how repetitive and ultimately how futile a large fraction of our lives really is. Once again, that's a kind of comparison to the mythological story of Sisyphus who is condemned to roll a boulder up a gigantic mountain only to see it roll back down to the bottom, to go back down to the bottom, roll it up again, and to do that circular activity infinitely. This, this character Sisyphus was an immortal being, so he had to do it infinitely. And of course, Cam uh, Camus' point is that isn't that how a lot of our lives actually are? Like a lot of repetitive labor and without any definite idea that it actually amounts to anything. Well, uh, after that, the, the next dimension of the absurd is going to have to do with hopelessness and meaninglessness. So, uh, <laughs> according to uh, Camus, our lives are actually, uh, when we're honest about it, marked by a kind of hopelessness. Let's look at that one first, hopelessness. Uh, okay, so what does he mean by that? What he means is that uh, a lot of the time in life, and maybe you've noticed this, uh, we hope for things and, I don't know, maybe half the time they end up uh, coming true. Our hopes get fulfilled and about half the time they don't. No, a little bit like the coronavirus. There seems to be a lot of randomness to the equation of whether our hopes get fulfilled or not, whether we end up getting what we actually hope for in our hearts. Some of the times, yes. Some of the times, no. And so when we look to life for a kind of definite confirmation of the centrality of hope in human affairs, life's response is, well, maybe yes, maybe no. In other words, like the idea that our lives have to center around hoping for things and then having those hopes be fulfilled in some way, well, life doesn't provide any confirmation of that, not any reliable confirmation of that, because about well, maybe half the time it will fulfill your hopes and half the time life will dash your hopes and you'll be left uh, bereft and broken, I guess, on the shore in some sense. So uh, because of that, it's actually an error to suppose that everyone needs something to hope for, which you hear all the time. This is like typical sort of uh, TV talk show logic, like something that they would say on the average TV talk show, and people would sort of automatically like applaud, like it's so uh, such an obvious truth. Well, everyone needs something to hope for, right? And all people are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, well, the fact of the matter is uh, that life doesn't center around getting what we hope for that hope is a kind of deflection away from the deeper and more unsettling reality, that there's enough randomness in life such that some of the time you'll end up getting what you hope for and some of the time you won't. But the idea that everyone needs something to hope for or that hope is fundamental to the human condition, that's a deflection away from the deeper reality of things. And the deeper reality of things is that we're lost in a kind of ocean of randomness. And yeah, we hope in the midst of that, but the fact of the matter is that hope isn't central to anything. It's not central to life. The universe doesn't particularly care whether you get what you hope for or not. Life doesn't particularly care whether you get what you hope for or not. Why doesn't it care? Because half the time it'll give it to you, half the time it won't, more or less. And the same is true of meaning. Okay, so let's uh, gloss meaning to help you understand this in the way that Viktor Frankl glosses meaning. Of course, Viktor Frankl is a, is a very famous uh, uh, psychologist, survivor of the concentration camps during World War II, and the progenitor of a school of psychotherapy called Logotherapy, which is oriented around finding meaning in life. Well, how does Viktor Frankl think of meaning? I think it's a, not a bad way of thinking about it, and it goes like this. Well, meaning is about uh, determining some goal in your life that you construe as worthwhile and then making uh, efforts, 
to try to attain it as best you can. Well, the thing about uh, meaning, if you understand meaning that way, is that it turns out to be a lot like hope. That some of the time you're able to fulfill the kind of goals that would imbue your life with meaning, but a lot of the time you're not. And that's not just true of you, it's true of every human being. That a lot of the time what seems to uh, confer purpose on your life, you'll end up fulfilling, but a lot of the time you won't, you know? And uh, so this business of hopelessness and meaninglessness, I'm hoping you you sort of hear a similar thread in the analysis of these, because from Camus' point of view, uh, the real task of existing as a human being is to actually listen to what life is actually telling us, take in what life is actually asking us to experience, and not to deflect ourselves away from that reality by one form of philosophical suicide or another. And for him, hope and meaning, far from being essential to the human condition, are deflections away from the reality that life is actually asking us to experience. They're way, uh, ways of pinning uh, the value of our lives on something that may or may not end up happening in the future because the fact of the matter is life is capricious. Life is random. Life is full of all sorts of aleatory, uh, <laughs> aleatory, okay, possible vocabulary word, kind of a fancy word for uh, randomness, let's say that. So alia in Latin is, is the Latin word for dice, like you play dice games. Okay, so randomness, so aleatory. Life is, to a large extent, aleatory. Let's use your new vocabulary word, hopefully in a cool way. I don't know, you might drop that one in a bar sometime once we get over the uh, coronavirus. So, uh, okay, connection to coronavirus. So in much the same way that the coronavirus seemingly kills off people, not in a completely random way for sure, but there certainly seems to be a fair amount of randomness in the equation. And like I said in the beginning, I think that it's that randomness that freaks us out most about the coronavirus. It's not uh, the fact of its lethality as it's demonstrated itself so far, because the lethality seems uh, more or less on the par as the everyday, every year flu that we have. So I think it's the randomness that's really sort of uh, uh, freaking us out. But the thing is that that kind of randomness is part and parcel of life, right? So it's really, in the last video, I suggested that life itself might be, in some sense, the plague. And here's maybe a way of making sense of that, that, like, you know, life insofar as it's aleatory, use of your new vocabulary word, because that's how much I care about you. Um, because life is so random and capricious and aleatory, it'll, it'll cut you down maybe tomorrow or maybe it'll let you live for the next 50 years. Who knows? None of us can say. Maybe it will uh, f provide what you hope for, your deepest hopes and the deepest recesses of your heart, and maybe it won't. Maybe it will uh, allow you to fulfill something that imbues your life with meaning, and maybe it won't. But the harsh reality, and it's a reality that we flee from at every turn, pretty much, into one form of philosophical suicide or another, is that life is capricious, and that's what we don't want to recognize. Well, Camus is actually asking us to rec recognize that because it's real. So there's sort of a famous quote, and I may butcher it a little bit because I'm about to paraphrase it from memory, that uh, goes something like this. The world that's real is not the world that is desirable. So from that point of view, hope and meaning and constructs like that are what we would find desirable. We hope for what we desire, but that's often, not all the time, but often at variance with the reality that life is actually showing us. And I think you can see that in uh, the corona stuff. I mean, man, if you want a confirmation of whether life is absurd or not, look around in these times, in these days of coronavirus, and I think you can find a fairly direct and ready confirmation of how unreasonable and how absurd life actually is. So, uh, life isn't tied particularly to our hopes or to our meanings. In fact, it's indifferent to all of that, cycling through your notes a little bit right now. So he sees hope and meanings basically as forms of philosophical suicide, as a kind of disease, as distractions, as a source of disengagement from the reality of the moment, and so on. And uh, he concludes this section of the book by making 
a kind of pronouncement that I guess has a kind of logical coherence with respect to what he says. Personally, I can go pretty far out in understanding these thinkers and uh, even finding value in what they say, but I think here he goes a little bit beyond even my line, which is quite the accomplishment when he says uh, on page 61 of your book, because of all this stuff we've talked about so far, uh, what matters most, what counts is not the best living, but the most living. In other words, uh, another way of committing uh, philosophical suicide related to hope and meaning would have to do with the construct of the quality of our lives. Because a little bit like hope and meaning, like life might provide a confirmation of what you think of as the quality of your life, but uh, you know, there's a fair chance that it won't. Like life will sort of beat you up no matter what it, you think the quality of your life is. Like let's say you think of yourself as a good person. Well, the fact of the matter is that sometimes good people suffer the most. Sometimes good people die the fastest. And here maybe I should make note of the fact that Albert Camus wrote another book called The Plague. A little bit topical, I think, for our times, that illustrates that principle. So in his novel, The Plague, he was actually more famous for his novels than he was for this particular work we're looking at. And The Plague is, well, it's not one of his most famous novels, but it's certainly one of them. It has to do with uh, describing a whole range of characters that have different qualities and uh, I guess would appear on different places in the mor moral ethical hierarchy and the thing about the plague is the novel wears on is you get a sense for how random and capricious it really is that you know sometimes it'll kill off a bad person but it's equally likely to kill off a good person you know sometimes it'll save a good person but it's equally likely to save a bad rotten criminal and so uh, you know life is like that whether we like it or not so the only question is not whether life is going to be capricious or not the only question is whether we're going to have enough honesty to look that capriciousness and that randomness in the face and learn to live accordingly, rather than to sort of dwell in the, uh, you know, in the kind of fantasy realm of our attempts to commit philosophical suicide in one form or, form or another. Whether it takes the form of pinning our hopes and the meaning of our lives onto some events in the future that may or may not transpire, or whether it uh, takes the form of indulging in the fantasy that our accomplishments actually matter to the universe somehow, which we saw in the last video prior to this one, or whether it takes the form of deflecting ourselves away from the uncomfortable tension between wanting to know the answers to life's fundamental questions and yet being in a kind of existence where that's not provided for us, not even a little bit, is secondary. Like all of that is secondary. So the question then is, how can we confront all of that and still find a reason to, excuse me, move forward in life? And the answer to that is going, for Camus, is going to be cast in terms of the theme of existential defiance. Okay, so we've seen this theme before when we were looking at Dostoevsky and more uh, specifically at Dostoevsky's notes from the underground. Uh, we saw the theme of spite and existential defiance, which is, from the point of view of that work, a way of laying claim to sort of the wider horizon of our freedom. So our freedom has to include both the positive and the negative, and so the choices of the negative, although at one level they seem like a kind of uh, repudiation or a kind of scorning of the obvious logic of life, actually provide a... Uh, access to a deeper range of human freedom than we'd otherwise have and actually ultimately make our freedom something real rather than something mechanical. That's all from Dostoevsky. So a similar theme we find in Camus, the vocabulary that he uses, the main way he has of describing this is uh, using the word scorn, which I have there in bold letters in your notes as I'm looking at your notes on my own laptop here. So uh, scorn. So the question is, uh, what is scorn? Now, here let's bring back the idea of the condemnation of Sisyphus. So once again, Sisyphus condemned to this infinitely circular and futile uh, life, although the word life doesn't really fit because uh, Sisyphus is immortal, so a kind of infinite life, that's really a contradiction because life is defined by death for us, you know. 
So uh, he's he's. But in any case, he's condemned to this this existence, perpetual existence of uh, circular and futile labor. So the question uh, from that point of view is, how does Sisyphus deal with his infinite condemnation? And the answer to that is uh, going to be by way of this idea of scorn or existential defiance. And of course, hopefully you're already hearing that this is a metaphor for our own lives. Like, how can we take up our condemnation, although we're not gods, uh, we're here for a limited amount of time, but if our existence has some of the defining attributes of a kind of condemnation, and he's suggesting that it does, that we are, in a sense, condemned to live out lives marked to a large extent by absurdity and unreasonableness that takes a bunch of different forms, and we've gone through those, I guess, a few minutes ago. Like, how can we find a coherent and lucid response that does not fall into the trap of any form of suicide? How can we do that? And existential defiance is going to be part of the answer to that. So, for, for Camus, the way uh, Sisyphus can deal with his condemnation is not to accept it. Okay? So that's the first thing. And that's probably the first answer you would think of. Would be, well, you know, uh, the way to deal with it is to accept it in some sense. But for Camus, Acceptance of the absurd is a non sequitur. Okay, non sequitur, that means it doesn't follow. That's a Latin phrase, it means it doesn't follow. In other words, it's incoherent. It's an incoherent response to the absurd. And the reason why is because if you think that you can accept the absurdity and unreasonable of existence, if you think you can just sort of, um, I guess, put your arms around it or embrace it somehow, then you haven't yet realized how bad the situation is how absurd and unreasonable your life really is. Because if you were to really realize it and really feel that at every level of your being, your response would not be one of acceptance. Your response would not be one of embracing or anything like that. Your response would naturally be one of defiance. So the absurd and existential defiance are really tightly interlinked from the point of view of Camus' analysis. And so acceptance, or any form of acceptance, would be a kind of theater to him that is, if not a form of philosophical suicide, at least on the road to philosophical suicide. So the answer is not going to have to do with acceptance as such. So defiance. Now uh, here, maybe the easy way to, to help you understand what existential defiance is, is to, to think about condemnation maybe in its more literal sense. Like suppose you were uh, condemned to a prison sentence, all right? So you were put in, in jail and you had to spend some amount of time in prison. What would be the most defiant way that you could possibly uh, go through that experience? And uh, the, first, the first couple of obvious answers are not going to be very good answers. The first obvious answer would be to, to be angry and to, to fight perhaps everyone and everything within your, the purview of what you can see and experience in prison. Uh, to get in fights all the time with the system, with other prisoners, to just sort of make out and out fighting the leitmotif of your life for that period of time. And uh, the, the answer, uh, the, the Camusian response to that would be, well, that's not actually the most defiant thing you could possibly do. And the reason why is because if you're angry all the time by being condemned in an odd sort of way, you're agreeing with the whole structure of the condemnation. Because when people condemn you to prison, you're supposed to be having a bad time. You're supposed to be angry about it, or at least depressed about it. Like you're supposed to be in some kind of negative emotional state. And that's why it's a condemnation. That's why it's a form of punishment. If you were in some sort of positive state, all of a sudden it wouldn't be a punishment as such. So for your incarceration to have the character of a condemnation, you can't just go around being angry and fighting and defiant in that sort of trivialized sense. Here's the second answer that doesn't work. The most defiant thing you could do if you were in prison would be to commit suicide, literal suicide, you know, so to hang yourself perhaps in, in your cell or something like that. 
Um, that's not a coherent response either. And the reason why is something a little bit similar to the whole treatment of anger. Like if you decide that the most defiant response would be to kill yourself, well, in a way, once again, you're agreeing with the character of the condemnation, right? So you're so, if your uh, response is that you're so miserable that you can't even continue living, in a way, you're doing exactly what the condemnation would have you do, be miserable. Once again, it's not a condemnation if you're having a good time. So, and maybe you're getting, <laughs> you're already starting to sense what the Camusian uh, business of defiance would be in that kind of situation. The most defiant thing you could do would be to have a good time in prison. And the reason why is because th having a good time in prison negates the essential character of the condemnation in the first place. Like if you go in and you're, you're happy, and I gave you an example in your notes uh, of Timothy Leary was sort of an example of that, although uh, who is that uh, inside st stock trader? Uh, Martha Stewart was another example of this. Like, but let's look at Timothy Leary because that's the one that's in your notes. So Timothy Leary, in case you don't know who he was, was one of these, uh, he was sort of a uh, maverick uh, professor of psychology from Harvard who uh, very early on got into LSD research and once they made LSD illegal, he decided he was going to continue on extolling the virtues of it as a way of expanding consciousness and all of that kind of stuff. And of course, they made it illegal, so he was doing illegal things in essence, so they put him in prison. Now the thing about Timothy Leary was that he was a very charismatic rabble-rouser type of character, especially in the 1960s. Um, and so they weren't going to put him in the general population, the prison population, when they put him in prison. They put him in isolation. So uh, isolation, in case you don't know this, is the worst form of punishment. Usually that's reserved for people that murder other people within the prison system and so on, that you're in a concrete cell for, I guess, 23 hours a day or something like that. And so they reserved for him the very worst sort of condemnation. Now, uh, how did Timothy Leary take this up? Well, uh, he got through it, and when they released him, uh, the reporters, of course, wanted to ask him like what it was like, and they were expecting a big show of contrition and uh, uh, apology and, well, I'm, I was wrong and all of that kind of stuff. Well, here's how he came out of prison. He said, well, uh, yeah, solitary confinement. I spent a lot of time in solitary confinement, and I'll tell you what, it was the greatest experience of my life. You know, being a celebrity, being popular, being a person whose name is in the news all the time meant that I was constantly being run ragged by appointments and interviews and, uh, you know, all the dynamics of celebrity and popularity. And what I really needed was some downtime. I'll tell you what, prison was the best thing. I couldn't have asked for a better vacation. I wanted to get into extended periods of meditation anyhow. And going to prison and especially, especially solitary confinement was the best vacation I could have had at this point in my life. I'm incredibly and profoundly grateful for the experience. I feel much uh, refreshed and much happier as a result of it. And uh, hopefully as I'm going on about this, you can sort of catch the edge of uh, what a clever, in a way, reversal uh, it was going on there. It's like, well, damn, we wanted you to have a bad time. We wanted you to come crawling out of that solitary confinement hole with a big show of uh, apology and uh, contrition and all of that kind of stuff. And you're giving us the exact opposite. You were, you're thanking us and you're telling us it was one of the happiest and most fruitful times of your life because you got to do what you wanted to do anyhow. And it's like, well, damn, you son of a bitch. Like, we try to punish you and you aren't even willing to be punished. Now, are you getting it like that? You, do you see how defiant that is? That's the point I'm trying to make. Well, that same kind of defiance might ex expand out beyond the walls of the prison to the walls of the figurative prison we're all in, uh, which would be one way, I guess, of describing human existence. Okay, I'm sorry, the camera once again did its auto shut off uh, function. So uh, let me just make this a last point that, uh, Real defiance uh, in this um, life, not just in the life of prison, but within sort of the, the macrocosm of human existence, might not take the form of being uh, miserable all the time or depressed all the time or seeking to find uh, 
one form of suicide or another to try to escape it or at least deflect, deflect our attention away from the absurdity of existence and the hopelessness ultimately of existence and the meaningless ultimately of, of existence. The, the, uh, the most defiant thing you could possibly do is to be lucidly aware of all of that and yet be happy. Find some way of being happy nonetheless in your, in your life. Although happiness now is going to mean something very different from what the word happiness normally means because it's going to be in a, in a very direct and intimate contact with this whole business of defiance, which sets up a kind of paradox. Like what is the kind of happiness that is at the same time fundamentally defiant? And the, the second thing I wanted to say, I'm trying to sort of put an end to this video because I think it's starting to get long, is this business of defiance is also what keeps suicide from being a coherent, reasonable response to the absurd. Because if you're really in touch with the absurd, you will be defiant of it. And the most defiant thing you could do with respect to the absurdity of life is not try to escape it, because a little bit like in a kind of prison condemnation, the most defiant thing you could do would be to end your life out as it will and not escape it. The most defiant thing you could do is to be exactly lucidly aware of what you're going through and at the same time find a kind of happiness in it, which would be the opposite of committing suicide, either literal or philosophical. Okay, um, I think we're going to have one more lecture on Camus and that'll set you up for uh, test three or test two, I'm sorry, uh, on Wednesday coming up. So uh, until then, uh, have a great day. Uh, see if you can notice the absurdity of uh, existing in the time of the coronavirus and wonder about the dimension of randomness in it and how that is uh, not only what is freaking us out about the coronavirus, but uh, might be something that freaks us out about life itself. All right. Have a good day. Bye-bye.